It occurs to me that uh, not many people know how to put on a tie. So I am going to, before I start reading today, um, A Distant Mirror, uh, I'm going to put on my tie. You know, like, uh, I guess this is my Mr. Rogers moment here. So really, it's, uh, it's one of those things where short, long, over. Like that, right? Go like that. Like that. Pull it through. And, uh, and then it's just back and forth. Kind of have to pull it that way and pull it this way until you get it just right. And that's really, that is it, you know? There's no magic. Or maybe there is magic, but um, that's it. And I know that there are a lot of videos out there. Um, you know, I, I find them so annoying because they, they go too slow for me. You know, I just, you know, just show me how to do it. And I just want to do it. So uh, if this helped you, I don't know. But uh, let us continue on with uh, A Distant Mirror by Barbara Tuckman. And uh, I haven't looked up whether Barbara is related to um, a reporter that also has the last name of Tuckman, who I believe works for CBS. But that is neither here nor there, as I did not look it up. And... Uh, I'm pretty unprepared today for just about everything, which is not surprising considering the um, state of my life right now. All right, so where was I? I think we were talking about um, Brother John, was it? Who uh, died of pestilence but foiled oblivion. And um, I think that we got to the larger cities. Okay. I think this is, I think, yeah. So I'll just read the end of this uh, paragraph. I think that, uh, I'll just start in this. No one's going to know. All right. So houses collapsed, church towers toppled, villages were crushed, and the destruction reached as far as Germany and Greece. Emotional response, dulled by horrors, underwent a kind of atrophy, epitomized by the chronicler who wrote, and in these days was burying without sorrow and wedding without friendship. Friendship spelled friend in the usual way with S-C-H-I-P-P-E as it originated. In Siena, where more than half the inhabitants died of plague, work was abandoned on the great cathedral, planned to be the largest in the world, and never resumed owing to the loss of workers and master masons and the melancholy and grief of the survivors. The cathedral truncated the cathedral's truncated transept still stands in permanent witness to the sweep of the death of death scythe. Agnolio di Tura, a chronicler of Siena, recorded the fear of contagion that froze every other instinct. Father abandoned child, wife husband, one brother another, he wrote, for this plague seemed to strike through the breath and sight, and so they died and no one could be found to bury the dead for money or friendship. And I, Angolo di Tura, called the fat, buried my five children with my own hands, and so did many others likewise. 
There were many to echo his account of inhumanity, and few to balance it, for the plague was not the kind of calamity that inspired mutual help. Its loathsomeness and deadliness did not herd people together in mutual distress, but only prompted the des their desire to escape each other. Magistrates and notaries refused to come and make the wills of the dying, reported a Franciscan friar of Pisa in Sicily. What was worse, even the priests did not come to hear their confessions. A clerk of the Archbishop of Canterbury reported the same of English priests who turned away from the care of their beneficies from fear of death. Cases of parents deserting children and children their parents were reported across Europe from Scotland to Russia. The calamity chilled the hearts of men, wrote Boccaccio in his famous account of the plague in Florence that serves as his introduction to the Decameron. One man shunned another, Kinsfolk held aloof. Brother was forsaken by brother. Oftentimes husband by wife. Nay, what is more, and scarcely to believed, fathers and mothers were found to abandon their own children to their fate, untended, unvisited, as if they had been strangers. Exaggeration and literary pessimism were common in the 14th century, but the Pope's physician Guy de Coliac was a sober, careful observer who reported the same phenomenon. A father did not visit his son, nor the son his father. Charity was dead. Yet, not entirely. In Paris, according to the chronicler Jean de Venette, the nuns of the Hotel Dieu, or municipal hospital, having no fear of death, tended the sick with all sweetness and humility. New nuns repeatedly took the places of those who died, until the majority many times renewed by death now rest in peace with Christ, as we may piously believe. When the plague entered northern France in July 1348, it settled first in Normandy, and, checked by winter, gave Picardy a deceptive interim until next summer. Either in mourning or warning, Black flags were flown from church towers of the worst stricken villages of Normandy, and at that time, wrote a monk of the Abbey of Forcarment, the mortality was so great among the people of Normandy that those of Picardy mocked them. The same unneighborly reaction was reported of the Scots, separated by a winter's immunity from the English. Delighted to hear of the disease that was scourging the Southrons, they gathered forces for an invasion laughing at their enemies. Before they could move, the savage mortality fell upon them too, scattering some in death and the rest in panic to spread the infection as they fled. In Picardy, in the summer of 1349, the pestilence penetrated the castle of Cousy to kill Engerard's mother Catherine and her new husband. Whether her nine-year-old son escaped by chance or was perhaps living elsewhere with one of his guardians is unrecorded. In nearby Amiens, Amiens, I don't know, tannery workers responding quickly to the losses in the labor force combined to bargain for higher wages. In other place, villages, villagers were seen dancing to drums and trumpets, and on being asked the reason, answered that seeing their neighbors die day by day while their village remained immune, they believed that they could keep the plague from entering by the jollity that is in us. That is why we dance. Further north in Tournay, on the border, in, on the border of Flanders, Gil Ilmusis, abbot of St. Martin's, kept one of the epidemic's most vivid accounts. The passing bells rang all day and night, he recorded, because the sextons were anxious to obtain their fees while they could. Filled with the sound of mourning, the city became oppressed by fear, so that the authorities forbade the tolling of the bells and the wearing of black and restricted funeral services to two mourners. The silencing of the funeral bells and criers' announcements of deaths was ordained by most cities. Siena imposed a fine on the wearing of mourning clothes by all except widows. Flight was the chief recourse for those who could afford it or arrange it. 
The rich fled to their country places, look like Boccaccio's long, young patricians of Florence, who settled on, in a pastoral place, removed on every side from the roads, with wells of cool water and vaults of rare wines. The urban poor died in their burrows, and only the stench of their bodies informed neighbors of their death. That the poor were more heavily afflicted than the rich was clearly remarked at the time. In the north, as in the south, a Scottish chronicler, John of Forden, stated flatly that the pest attacked especially the meaner sort and common people, seldom the magnates. Simon de Covino of Montpelier made the same observation. He ascribed it to the misery and want and hard lives that made the poor more susceptible, which was half the truth. Close contact and lack of sanitation was the unrecognized other half. It was noticed, too, that the young died in greater proportion than the old. Simone de Covino compared the disappearance of youth to the withering of flowers in the fields. In the countryside, peasants dropped dead on the roads, in the fields, in their houses. Survivors in growing helplessness fell into apathy, leaving ripe wheat uncut and livestock un unattended, untended. Oxen and asses, sheep and goats, pigs and chickens ran wild, and they too, according to the local reports, succumbed to the pest. English sheep, bearers of the precious wool, died throughout the country. The chronicler Henry Knighton, canon of Leicester Abbey, reported 5,000 dead in one field alone, their bodies so corrupted by the plague that neither beast nor bird would touch them, and spreading an appalling stench. In the Austrian Alps, wolves came down to prey upon sheep, and then, as if alarmed by some invisible warning, turned and fled back into the wilderness. In remote Dalmatia, border wolves descended upon a plague-stricken city and attacked human survivors. For want of herdsmen, cattle strayed from place to place and died in hedgerows and ditches. Dogs and cats fell like the rest. The dearth of labor held a fearful prospect because the 14th century lived close to the annual labor harvest for both food and for next year's seed. So few servants and laborers were left, wrote Knighton, that no one knew where to turn for help. The sense of a vanishing future created a kind of dementia of despair. A Bavarian chronicler of Newburgh on the Danube recorded that men and women wandered around as if mad and let their cattle stray because no one had any inclination to concern themselves about the future. Fields went uncultivated, spring seed unsown, Second growth with nature's awful energy crept back over cleared land, dikes crumbled, salt water reinvaded and soured the lowlands. With so few hands remaining to restore the work of centuries, people felt, in Walsingham's words, that the world could never again regain its former prosperity. Though the death rate was higher among the anonymous poor, the known and the great died too. King Alfonso the 11th of Castile was the only reigning monarch killed by the pest, but his neighbor, King Pedro of Aragon, lost his wife, Queen Lenora, and his daughter, Marie, and a niece in the space of six months. John Cantacuzin, uh, <laughs> Cantacuzin, Cuzain, Emperor of Byzantium, okay, lost his son. In France, the lame Queen Jean, well, that's mean, the lame Queen Jean. Anyway, her daughter-in-law, uh, Bonne de B Luxembourg, wife of the Dauphine, both died in 1349 in the same phase that took the life of Engerard's mother. Jean, Queen of Navarre, daughter of Louis X, was another victim. Edward III's second daughter, Joanna, who was on her way to marry Pedro in the air and the castle, died in Bordeaux. Women appear to have been more vulnerable than men, because perhaps, being more housebound, they were more exposed to fleas. Boccaccio's mistress, Fiamentia, Fiamentia, 
Fiamette, illegitimate daughter of the king of Naples, died, as did Laura, the beloved, whether real or fictional, of Petrarch, reaching out to us in the future, Petrarch cried, O oh, happy posterity, who will not experience such abysmal woe, and will look upon our testimony as a fable. In Florence, Giovanni Villani, the great historian of his time, died at 68 in the midst of an unfinished sentence. In the midst of this pestilence, there came to an end, dot, dot, dot. Siena master painters, the brothers Imbroglio and Piet Pietro Lorenzetti, whose names never appear after 1348, presumably perished in the plague, as did Andrea, Andrea Pisano, architect and sculptor of Florence. William of Ockham, the English mystic, Richard Roll of Hampole, both disappear from mention after 1349. Francisco Dattini, merchant of Prato, who I've mentioned before, it was a really good uh, account of him and uh, his farm, mostly his wife and her record keeping. Anyway, I digress. Anyway, he lost both his parents and two siblings. Curious sweeps of mortality afflicted certain bodies of merchants in London. All eight wardens of the Company of Cutters, all six wardens of the Hatters, and four wardens of the Goldsmiths died before July 1350. Sir John Paul Tenney, Master Draper, four times Mayor of London, was a victim. Likewise, Sir John Montgomery, Governor of Calais. And, uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna end that there. Tomorrow we uh, we can look forward to a, a little bit more accounting of government officials and uh, church people who also met their maker. Or, I mean, if you believe in that. And then we're gonna get on to um, carriers, rats and fleas. I know everyone is dying to hear more about that. So, with that, I bid you good night. <laughs>